Welcome everyone. We're going to begin and there'll be others joining us shortly, I believe. Um, and this is the launch of Pandemic Poems and uh, very fortuitously, the poems just arrived today from the press. So we're very excited. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging it, uh, Indigenous land acknowledgement, um, acknowledging UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And also acknowledge that many of you are joining us today from other places and I acknowledge the traditional rights holders, and stewards uh, of those lands. My name is Diane Newell and I'll be your moderator for this evening's UBC Emeritus College event. I'm Professor Emerita of History and a member of the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at UBC and I'm a former principal of the Emeritus College. My uh, longtime friend, uh, 40 years, Phil, I figure it is as of this year, uh, Phil Resnick asked me to play the role of moderator. And of course, I was delighted to say yes. Not the least because I've been reading almost on a daily basis for over a year, poems arriving in my email box uh, and my inbox. And sometimes these are prefaced by the words, I've been afraid that I'll lose the muse, but I've not so far. And indeed, Phil never did lose that muse, as you can see in the 125 pages of poems. And those, and that's not the full complement of poems that he produced and came into my inbox. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce the participants this evening, all of whom, of course, were selected by Phil. Phil Resnick himself is a distinguished emeritus professor of political uh, science with a longtime interest in writing poetry, so much so that he's already published seven books of poetry and oh, has co-founded with George McWhorter, the UBC Emeritus College Odyssey Group, which is about reading, writing, and listening to poetry. We'll also hear from, in order, Seymour Main, who is Emeritus Professor of English from the University of Ottawa and a poet of many, many collections and translations to his credit. George McWhorter is an Emeritus Professor in Creative Writing from UBC and a much published poet and translator who was Vancouver's very first poet laureate. Sherry Simon is a professor in the Department of French Studies at Concordia University, Montreal, and is best known for her work on translation and on gender. And finally, Douglas Todd is a popular columnist with the Vancouver Sun newspaper, who has written extensively on important subjects of the day, ranging from religion to immigration to housing. Each of the participants will be reading a poem from Phil's collection they've chosen for this event. At midpoint in the readings, there will be an interlude in the form of a six minute wondrous musical video chosen by Phil to complement various aspects of his pandemic poems. At the end of the poems, there'll be a few words from the publisher, Ronsdale Press of Vancouver. And, and uh, we should therefore at the end have a little time left for comments from the audience before we say good night. And I would ask people to feel free to um, uh, add comments to the chat and to actually read the comments on the chat as they come up as well. I'm sure they'll be interesting. This, this um, evening will, is being recorded and um, all, as I understand it, all the people who are registered will be sent a link to, the, to it so that they can look at it again or share it with others. And with that, I will, I will turn it over to Phil Resnick, who will be reading the first poem, and the readers will turn it, will kind of internally keep on turning it over. We'll stop midway for the video, which I will introduce at that time. Thank you. So, thank you, Diane, and uh, hello to everybody, uh, both here in Vancouver and out there. Oh, am I not muted? I'm trying to see what's going on. No, I'm mute. No, you can hear me, right? Yep. I'm on. Good. And hello to everyone, not only here in Vancouver, but with Zoom. The one advantage of Zoom is you can actually have people from other parts of the country, a few from the States. There are even going to be one or two friends from overseas. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for the other to the other participants. And not least, but last but not well, last but not least, I also want to thank uh, Sandra and Christina from the uh, Emeritus College, who, the staff who have helped to make this technically possible, which is quite a bit of work involved in that. So uh, I didn't set out to write pandemic poems, that's for sure. Uh, it came because the pandemic came. 
like everyone else uh, that, until last February, March, there were other plans. In fact, I had a, a little memoir that was gonna be published last, that was published last year, and there was gonna be a launch for that. Well, that never happened. I was planning to go off in the spring as, I, as I've been doing for the last three or four years to Greece, which is the, the native land of my, my late wife, and which has become a kind of second home. Well, that didn't happen. And like everyone else, I found myself confined in my case in Vancouver, not a horrible place to be confined, I must say. There's, well, there's trails and there's, there's the forest trails and the sea and all that, but still uh, there's a sense of being confined. And, uh, but I did discover early on and to my surprise that I started to write poems uh, on the pandemic theme. And before I knew it, I was developing a pandemic muse, or at least I had a pandemic muse, which is essentially what has resulted in the collection, which has just been published, Pandemic Poems. And um, I think the analogy I would make, I don't want to overdo it, is uh, there's a quite famous journal of the plague year that was uh, written by Daniel Defoe. And I write about, I mentioned this in the little preface of the book, he dealt with the Great Plague of London, as it was called, 1665-6. And it occurred to me as the years was going, years going by, and I was thinking of this book, that maybe it would be a good idea to see this as a kind of a journal of the plague year, the year 2020. Because the first poem starts in, uh, in February, and the very last poem in the book is dated December 31st, 2020. I did not add any poems that I've written since. So it is a kind of poetic journal of the plague year. And as we all know, it's a year and not it's going on that has turned our lives upside down. So a lot of the poems inevitably deal with that theme. So what I'm going to do is read a poem, which in some ways is the keynote poem for the entire book. It's not the first poem in the book, but I think it's the key one in terms of setting the tone. And it's called The Lucky Generation. So, so there, it's going to, there'll be, a, there'll be in all the readings, there's going to be, as right now, you can see it on the screen, and then I'll just read on the side here. The Lucky Generation. We called ourselves the Lucky Generation. In many ways, we were spared the wars, the dole, the diseases, the backbreaking toll that had been our predecessors' lot, and that of the myriads who had come before them. There was comfort in knowing we could choose which college to enroll in, which profession we might enter, what city or country to put roots down in, where we might holiday, winter or summer, or retire to when our working lives were over. There were passing clouds in the sky, Islamist disruptions here and there, the occasional economic downturn, hints of glaciers melting or sea levels rising, but for the large part, these were problems the millennials and their offspring would have to bear. And suddenly we learned how quickly the script could be rewritten, carefully constructed stage sets taken down, the myths of exponential growth, globalization as some kind of magic key, affluence as a guarantee of personal immunity reduced to tatters. The old Greek precept, which Solon had first uttered, had stood the test of time. Do not count yourself fortunate until your final day. At this point, I will pass it on to an old, my, one of my very old friend of mine, Seymour Maine. Hard to believe we were in kindergarten together back in 1949-50, that is 71 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> but we've managed to, amazingly, we've also managed to retain and maintain our friendship over that long period of time. That itself is no small feat, but I think we've managed quite well. Anyway, it gives me great pleasure. Seymour's in Ottawa, it gives, and he's a poet in his own right, and it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to him. Thank you, Philip, and thank you to the uh, Meredith College. You do wonderful work at my alma mater, UBC. Uh, which should be emulated by many other campuses. Uh, Philip stole the first story I was going to tell. Uh, I still have documentary proof that we were we met in 1949. I have our kindergarten picture, and <laughs> there's Philip there with the same insouciant, bemused smile, with a little more hair on his head then than he has now. But uh, we all seem to look the same. But our our, our literary fates intertwined when we entered McGill in 1961. We both were writing poetry and he submitted an early manuscript and I submitted an early manuscript for the Chester McNaughton Prize. It was the, the big prize at, at the McGill because uh, years before 
Leonard Cohen had won first prize. So in 1962, beginning poets, we won first and second prize. I, I won't rub it to him. I got first prize, he got second prize, but his <laughs> first prize got published soon after as a book. And here it is, it's, uh, if you can see it, between, I don't know if I'm showing it well, between two Holocausts, it came out in 1962. So he's been publishing for a very, very long time indeed. And the interesting thing is that the themes he introduced, the social, political, prophetic themes he introduced when he was in his teens, he's still writing them today in a different form, but there's a continuity over all those years. Uh, from the that uh, uh, from the from the McGill years all the way through, but in this book, my feeling is Philip that you brought together the the scholar of politics with the lover of poetry and the muse, and you brought them together in uh, a very significant way. Uh, but the roots of it, the seeds of it, the matrix of it was back there all the way back when we were uh, we were at McGill. So one thing I say, you are consistent and you've continued it. I chose Contagion because it's one of the few poems in the, in the collection which has more than the, sing, the singular voice, the viewpoint of the speaker, which we always take to be an alter ego for Philip, commenting and making uh, his observations about the pandemic situation around us. In this one, we have other voices. And I thought this is a, a little bit more dramatic poem than the others. I really thought this is a one I would want to read. Contagion. Into the no notable city of Florence, there came the death-dealing pestilence, which had some years before appeared in parts of the East. Quotation from Boccaccio's The Decameron. Of what use is the past? The moderns asked, secure in the comforts of the present day and the promise of a future still at hand. Of what use the aged? The millennials chimed in. They who have enjoyed the earth's fruits these many years and refused to clear the way for those now come of age? Of what use the homeless and the poor? The well-off complained. They who spread vermin in their clothes and hair. Well, we must take shelter behind the ramparts of our homes. Of what use your pristine beaches and winter holidays, yes. the ascetics railed, when the pillars of your temples and pleasure palaces have come crashing down? Of what use your lamentations, the Sybarites replied, let us drink and eat and copulate our fill while we party through the night. And now I turn you over to George McWhirter. Hi. Thank you, Seymour. <laughs> yep. Okay. Um, Seymour has given you the background from kindergarten. Uh, recently, uh, we are in the uh, Emeritus College, most associated with Phil uh, through our poetry Odyssey group. Now, Phil is actually the intrepid leader. And uh, when there's a lull in the proceedings, uh, then Phil takes us on travels to Greece, the land as he has told us of his late wife and his other Greek family. Now there he takes us to the places of inspiration onto the mountains of the muses uh, that inspire his clear voiced, well wrought Parnassian poems. And these verses, as Seymour has shown, uh, can span uh, the globe from our Salish Sea to the Aegean. And from forest fires blazing in our own BC to the smoke spiraling of those on Lesbos. And so I come uh, to my poem by Phil that I'll read. Smoke and Ladders. 
The West Coast states are a tinderbox. The Sierras laced in smoke and flames. Stranded hikers lifted out for threat of life and limb. Smoke seeps into the lower mainland, air quality slowly sinking, even as the COVID index curves in the wrong direction. Others have it worse, much worse. The Moria holding camp on Lesbos, a total write-off. It's cramped and desperate asylum seekers caught between the ashes, the virus, and the ire of islanders who have had enough. So on foes, month seven of the pandemic. <laughs> Thank you. There's one other poem I would like to read if I can. Yes. That's uh, The Prophets of Yore. And uh, as you know, like the best political commentators and poet prognosticators, uh, Philip has an eye on the now for his pronouncements. And although in the poem I'm going to read, he invokes the greater voice of the prophets of old, his purposely smaller, more focused, sincere, and no less moving verb of the viral is a good contemporary match for theirs. The prophets of yore. We miss them, those prophets with robes and deep voices, presaging the doom that clearly awaits us, the foe from afar, who will scourge us and purge us sins we've committed and ruinous behavior as the natural order dissolves all around us. We yearn for the hope that a voice from the desert will lift up our spirits and speak of the hilltops where sunlight is breaking and the cycle of plagues and wanton destruction can finally cease. And we know that their message, though stark, could ring hollow, and the God they bespoke has never has been silenced forever. Yet we yearn for the comfort of words of atonement that only those who have wrestled with torment can ever pronounce. Thank you. Lovely. Now we turn it over. Is it to Sherry? To me. We're doing Diane. Diane. We're wait we're going to do a video. This is the the video we're about to see is entitled November. The music is by the German composer Mac Richter. And the visuals are by his partner, the filmmaker, Julia Mayer. It's six minutes long.
What's goes what's going Phil. on? Goes to Phil now, Sandra. Yeah. Or Christina. But, well, I mean that's a very very powerful uh, uh, video. That's for sure. But between the music and the visuals, and the reason I thought it would be appropriate is because it really does touch in a very powerful way on if I use that old cliche, but it's more than a cliche, the human condition, both the ups and also, of course, the inevitable downs that follow. And uh, one of the lessons I think we've all learned from this pandemic, or one of the implications of the pandemic, we've been forced to look far more into our interiors and, and, and contemplate a little more seriously uh, our own mortality, and in some sense, even the mortality of our larger society and civilization out there in times like this or the, the risk of it and take these issues far more to heart than uh, than perhaps we do in the rush of everyday normal life so i thought it would be a very appropriate thing to uh, bring into it uh what i'm now going to do is just read i will read two poems of my own and then we'll carry on with the two other uh, participants who are going to be doing some readings the first one i've chosen is a poem called the floral arts and in, in a sense, it's directly, uh, I was inspired by the fact that my late wife, uh, Andromache, uh, enjoyed the spring because this was the time when she would pot flowers and, and so on and so forth. I was but her assistant, so it was not something I, I did at that duty more than I think out of love at that point. But last year, when, of course, travel had become impossible, I suddenly discovered that I, I, I might as well pot some of these myself. And uh, this poem is inspired by, by that. In fact, I've done it all over again. So the floral arts, let me, let me put this poem, we'll put it up. This would have been her favorite season, assembling the assorted geraniums, pansies, fuchsia, and asturtium, preparing the clay or ceramic receptacles, mixing compost, recycled earth, and potting soil in a rusting wheelbarrow, until the backyard, the deck, the front stairs as well, were a medley to the floral arts. You were but her assistant, reluctant at first to take her gardening seriously, endless visits to the nurseries, hours of labor that by the autumn had turned to dust. Yet here you sit in the season of the plague, surrounded by rainbow colors you have potted with your own hands, certain she would have taken pleasure in this belated homage. And the second poem I wanna read at this point is was inspired by a book. It's really a collection of novellas by a contemporary German writer, Jenny Erpendeck. Her book is called The End of Days. She's also, uh, turns out an opera director. She's quite, a, a, quite an accomplished person. And my poem is called Five Lives. Among other reasons I want to bring it in is because it refers to the Spanish flu. Uh, and uh, there's this, uh, I mentioned this in the poem, apparently back in 1918, 1919, there was a tram with a particular number on it, if it's in the poem, whose role it was, or which was used particularly at night to bring the cadavers by tram to the central mortuary in Vienna where they were disposed of. That's, that it almost brings, it evokes the pars we're seeing in a tragic way right now, in fact, uh, in India. And there's also a reference to nursing homes, which as we can remember was a very important part of the story, particularly here in Canada in the early months of the pandemic. So this poem is called Five Lives and I'll read it now. From the Polish plains to the Viennese woods to the killing fields of the borderlands, the tale folds and unfolds. Intermarriage that breaks the rules. Desperate times as the 7031 tram transports cadavers from the Spanish flu to Vienna central burial grounds. Confessions as the Stalin trials stay true to script. Berlin walls that come tumbling down. Nursing homes where memory sticks to the toast and jam and coffee stains the trembling hands of the confined. Imagined lives that we can relive as fate plays chess with destiny and generations who have had it good learn the signposts of calamity. And now I'll pass it on to another old friend. This is Sherry Simon. Uh, it doesn't quite go back to kindergarten, but if my memory serves me right, correct me, Sherry, if I'm wrong. 
back, we met for the first time back in 69, 70. We were both graduate students in Paris uh, doing, you know, doing our research. And I think we ran into each other at the Bibliothèque Nationale, if my memory serves me right. And we have remained in a strange way. We don't see each other all that often. I think we've been pretty strong friends ever since. So it's all yours. Okay. Thanks so much, Philip. <clears throat> and it's really, really a pleasure to be part of this. Um, yes, we are old friends going back to student days in Paris. And uh, I just wanted to mention uh, an event that I'm sure Philip thinks of every time he thinks of me. And this was a memorable summer driving trip uh, in Yugoslavia, mm. especially memorable because we almost saw our lives end there as we drove up a narrow mountain road right into an oncoming bus. And perhaps uh, I was, this is the little note I'd written to myself, perhaps this near encounter with mortality was the moment when Philip became a poet, but I'm learning all kinds of things this evening. And uh, Philip was a poet uh, many years before and I just, didn't, I just didn't know it. So I've been enjoying Philip's poems over the years uh, with their special relationship to the Greek landscape and to Greek myth. Um, they're shaped by a remarkable sensi sensibility and the more I listen, Philip, the more I think um, the word wisdom is very appropriate. So a combination of the intellectual's knowledge and curiosity and the sensuality of the more intuitive being. In these recent pandemic poems, pandemic poems, I especially appreciate the historical illusions that give us a long view of our current crisis. The view from a distance, from the wrong end of the binoculars, an attempt to give some sort of context to what we are experiencing, or at least precedent, as we heard in the last poem, to try to make sense of it as we navigate our way through the never-ending bleakness. And another way of creating this sense of distance is by imagining looking at the presence with other pairs of eyes. For instance, in the poem I've chosen, Philip imagines eyes from the past, those of the person he calls the poet, and is in fact Cavafy. I was especially happy to realize that the reference is to Cavafy, as he's a great favorite of mine. Uh, Cavafy was a poet intensely aware of living in a moment of historical change. As a Greek living in Alexandria, he was marginal to his own times, but he also understood himself as being in dialogue with the ancient Greeks. His most famous poem, Waiting for the Barbarians, is about living in a state of preparation for disaster, a disaster that, however, doesn't come at the expected time. Cavafy is also known for his eroticism. In the last lines of Philip's short poem, with its passions of flames of desi and desire and reference to lost youth, are a poignant reference to the terrible lack of physical contact that has come with the pandemic. So, here is the poem. What might the poet have said about pandemics rolling in from the East? Port cities ravaged, galleys infested, sailors consigned to their fate. What might the poet have said about how the saga would end? New generations stirring, old ones expiring as nature wreaked its revenge. What might the poet have said about Eros's masks and protective attire, not even a hint as the hours ticked by of the passions and flames of desire? What might the poet have said about the old in locked nursing homes? No loved one to haunt them, no mirrors to taunt them with flashes of the youth they'd once known. And now to you, Doug. Thanks, Sherry, and thanks, Phil. Um, I first got to know Phil as a journalist. He was one of the guys that uh, some of us in the newsroom would call up to get commentary on the issues of the day, especially in BC politics and Canadian politics. And secretly, we would phone him up because he usually agreed with us. So we'd <laughs> we could air our own views at the same time we're airing his views. But um, so sometimes I still, even with Phil's poetry, I think it is kind of as political poetry, political scientist 
poetry. Um, and I just find it so refreshing and so kind of honest. And um, George Orwell, Orwell would talk about plain language. And I appreciate the, the straightforward way he writes it. And it's not simple, but it's plain in a good sense. Uh, certainly not obscure for the sake of obscurity, which sometimes I find some poetry kind of goes that way. Um, Ingrid and I have talked about it, and we, the context is 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 the really the long arm of Western civilization and Western history and Western tradition. And Phil has so much respect for it and um, kind of love for it. Um, and of course, there's the emphasis on Greek mythology, which I like. <laughs> um, uh, it brings such depth to it, and that's partly owing to uh, Phil's former wife, late wife. Um, and just the, the people mentioned wisdom, it feels like a real distillation of um, uh, just incredible wisdom that uh, Phil's picked up over the years. Um, I, they're kind of newsy poems, which I like as a journalist. Phil, um, I sometimes blogged on the poems, I've tweeted some out and, and they kind of um, translate into social media in a not bad way because they are kind of on the news often. Um, so that's refreshing for a journalist to be able to do that with a poet. Um, let's see, I picked the poem, The Deserted Campus, because um, it sort of uh, got ahead of me. I ended up doing a feature on the deserted campus at UBC, SFU, you know, um, what's uh, the one in Capilano University. Um, and Phil kind of captured the mood that I ended up working with as a journalist. Um, I, and I must say in the poem that I'm gonna read, I was struck by the section on where Phil refers to it, the kind of what's happened to the knowledge economy, the knowledge economy. And it sort of does um, make me think about what's happening to universities these days where they are kind of an, becoming a bit more of an industry than they, than they used to be. Um, and once it's not deserted anymore, the campus, you kind of wonder what, what will it be like? So without that, without further ado, I'll just read it. The deserted, the, the deserted campus. Far, far away, thy children leave the land. Ill fares the land to hastening ills a prey. And that's a quote from Oliver Goldsmith, The Deserted Village. The campus where you spent your adult years is strangely silent, malls deserted, buildings largely closed to human contact. The knowledge economy pivot to a brave new world has fallen on bleak times, hollowed out like villages of yore or smokestack towns where factories once held sway. Here and there a masked passerby, a skittery library clerk advancing the volume over a sterilized tabletop like some purloined treasure from the deep. Row on row of classroom desks sit empty with darkened overheads. The noisy banter signaling a lecture's end, not soon to be repeated. Such is the state of things in year one of the pandemic. The alma mater, which its denizens held dear, a mothballed amphitheater with a chorus of ghostly refugees from yesteryear. Back to, back to Phil. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you, Sherry, as well. So I'm just going to read two more poems, and that'll be my last bit on this, and then we'll, we'll there'll be one or two other things to follow shortly. So uh, I read reference when Seymour, uh, when Seymour is beginning to this kindergarten, he, he mentioned this kindergarten picture, which a friend had sent us about a year ago. And there are the five-year-olds staring with, you know, some, some smiling and some kind of a little bit lost. And this prompted the following poem called The Kindergarten Picture, which I will now read uh, once it's on there. There it is. Thanks, Andrew. The five-year-olds sit in rows, a standing one holding up the rear. Most smiling at the camera, some with shut eyes or distracted grimaces, I think that was me, not knowing how their world will unfold. 
baby boomers before the term had been conceived, they had many steps to take before they might assume the roles that life in an affluent society could provide. How many are still alive 70 years after the photo had been taken? How many have had to come to terms with the setbacks and defeats which even the swiftest must endure? And what if today's pandemic kids whose virtual group photograph will grace a century that threatens to pay the price for the years of unchecked growth that marked the 1950 kindergarten class. Mm. And one other poem, and this will be the finale as far as the poems. This was written towards the end of the year, so December 17. And it's a little bit about what we're doing right now. We're having this interaction on Zoom. There's advantages. There's people, friends from back east and beyond who are, who are part of this, which wouldn't be true if we were doing a normal launch uh, with, you know, physically in town. But there's a price one pays for this. So this one is called Through a Looking Glass. And we've all been through this with Zoom, so that here it is. Back then, when we could greet each other with a friendly gesture or an embrace, engage in conversation face to face, not have to give a second thought to droplets in the air that might do us in or set us back for weeks and months. We were blissfully unaware a time might come when to interact would take place behind a mask if peradventure we found ourselves in a common space, but just as frequently through a looking glass in a parallel universe where things were never quite the same. So at this point, I want to turn it over to Hélène uh, Le Boucher from Bronzedale Press, and she'll just say a little bit about the book. And uh, the book has finally appeared and, and how you can get a hold of it. And then Diane will, will call and we'll sort of bring the proceedings in afterwards to a close. So Hélène. Hi, thanks uh, everyone for being here. I'm here with, uh, with Anne, and uh, we are really happy to publish uh, this book with you, Phil, uh, Pandemic Poems. So as we said, we just received it and uh, you can actually order the book if you want it uh, online right now. You just have to go on our website and you will find um, the link which on our welcome page, which will lead you directly um, to the, to, to, so you can, you can just like uh, buy it online. Or it will be uh, in libraries, in bookstores. Sorry, it will be in bookstores uh, on Monday because we will um, send it to our distributor. So you will be able to find it in, in bookstores really soon. Um, yeah, we are really happy that the book is here, ready. Uh, Philip worked hard on it, so we are really pleased to be able to sell you this book. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, congratulations to Ronsdale Press and also to uh, Philip for this uh, uh, very special edition uh, for us. I have to say that I was very teary in a couple of your poems, Phil. You, you really uh, chose the tough ones. And, um, and that is a, a comment that I wanted to put forward. First say, nobody has written anything in the chat room. No questions, no comments. So if you would Oh, there's one already. All right. So if you would mind doing that and also taking a look at what's written, that would be helpful. Um, but I wanted to ask, I was going to ask the uh, speakers, the, the readers, if they that you mentioned that this is a 125 page collection of a very tough subject, ranging in temporal space from antiquity to possible futures. And how, what was your thinking? What would you ever think about to actually choose one poem out of that. And most of you have already addressed that, although you're welcome to say more if you want. But George, you didn't say anything, maybe because you had other things to say as well. Did you want to add something about your choice, actually, of two poems? Well, uh, basically, um, it's a little bit like what Seymour said about drama. And you have I chose uh, the smoke and mirrors because the scene is dramatic. 
Oh. And uh, it's one of the poems where he captures uh, the, how could I say, the low points and the sharp points of the drama and how it switches from, as I already mentioned, it switches from Greece to BC and uh, the smoke mingles. And I really liked that panoramic, yeah. dramatic uh, aspect of the, of the poem. So that's why I chose that one. And um, I chose the other one. I said a uh, little bit about it, but um, I chose the prophets one because to some, and the word I used was uh, the political scientists and poets and um, commentators uh, make uh, pronouncements and often are about what's going on now, but with an eye to what's coming from what's going on now. And at the same time, I thought, uh, I loved the end of the poem, uh, especially that, which is almost um, a, an undercut at Philip's own role as the poet writing this poem, uh, where it says, uh, those who, only those who have wrestled with torment can pronounce. And so I thought it was, uh, you know, not that he hasn't gone through tragedy, losing uh, Andromache, his wife, uh, but in this particular situation, he's still healthy. And uh, there are all those, and those in the camp at Lesbos, for example, who are not who are in deep desperation, they are the ones who can speak. But since they can't speak, really he's speaking for them. Yeah. Can, can I say two words at this point? Because uh, I miss, yeah. Uh, George is my most recent friend by comparison to all the others who I've known <laughs> much longer. And we're, we're the co-conspirators, uh, if I may put it in brackets, in terms of this little group, the Poetic Odysseys, which we, which we, be, we started in the, in, the, in the college. But one of the things, others out there will not know George, but you can recognize perhaps by his voice that his background is Irish or Northern Irish, but Irish. And I was really struck, and this is not to put down by any way the three other readers, when George was reading these poems, my golly, there was a, a dramatic content to it. And there was this extraordinary kind of uh, uh, red, uh, well, it almost as though uh, the poetic thing runs naturally, because as we know, the Irish seem to be very well endowed in terms of the poetic tradition. And, and George is very, very good. And I've noticed this even in our little group, when he reads a poem, there's, it, it really does have a cadence and, and a quality that is very hard for us mere mortals, I think, to quite capture. So I, I, I really do thank him for having participated in this and, and for this wonderful reading of those poems. Thank you. Would any of the other speakers like to uh comment further on their choice or what they would have chosen if they had two poems to read or how do you feel about that? That's a good question. <laughs> well, Seymour, you had another one in mind, I remember, but you didn't, you know, you, you gave well, me a second I, choice. Listen, I played by the rules. I was told that <laughs> one poem and, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't think of asking for an extra poem, you know. I played by the rules, being an old professor. I like when they when students played by my rules, and I played by your, your rules. Um, but I, it's interesting because um, Sherry mentioned uh, Kafafi, and I think all throughout your the last, I'd say throughout the last the books that Ronsdale's published, there's a strong Kafafian flavor, a sense of the moment, which also has either historical resonance or the sense of the fleeting moment and the loss that's coming is about to come. So in many of your poems, you have a very strong, and that may be 
the, uh, the sojourn in, in Greece and your long relationship with Andrew Mackey, a blessed memory, and um, what other, you know, what other things were kind of unlocked in your writing? And I just wonder, you speak Greek, by the way? It's asking. Oh, yes. uh, modestly, you know, ever since, ever since, sadly, ever since the drama key died, uh, now I go back, I realized I had to force myself to actually make more efforts to speak the language. I don't speak it very well, but I've, I've come along a little more. In the old days, I had a built-in translator. I don't have a built-in translator anymore, so that changes the picture. And you I don't... Think yeah, and you haven't read, you don't read contemporary Greek or the poetry of the past 50, 100 years in Greece. You don't read it in Greek, right? You read it in English. Yeah, yeah I read it in English, but I have reached a point where some of Kavaki's poems, I can actually almost get my way through. If I know them well enough, I can I can decipher the Greek or, or Seferis, a couple of the others. But no, I don't want to exaggerate my grand knowledge of Greek, but it's it's better than zero. And it's not just a tourist, you know, a Calimera kind of stuff. It's a little bit more than that. So because it has come it, up a bit. In many of the poems, the way the poems unravel, they have a kind mm -hmm. of rhetorical structure. They remind me a lot of Kafafi's poems. I'm not saying you're in the Kafafi camp, but how the poems have a, a, a narrative, they're short poems, but they still have a narrative plot. And mm -hmm. each, each line, which is quite often a clause or a phrase, winds to the next one all the way through and reminds me very much of the English translation of Kafafi. I don't read Greek, and I've mm -hmm. read the Kafafi in three or four translations. Uh, the one I like best has always been Ray Dolphins, mm -hmm. uh, one of the earliest that came out about 60, 70 years ago, which introduced Kafafi besides uh, uh, one or two essays written about him to the English speaking world. So I think I sense that there. Maybe that's a good idea. Too bad I don't have a class right now. I could say to him, okay, term paper topic, you know, Greek poetry. Yeah, right. <laughs> sure. right. 1,500 words, due next Monday. That's it. I, I think, think Sherry also, was trying Sherry to get it. Yeah, I, I was just going to add that I, the more I listen to these poems tonight, and especially spoken by different voices, because which I think is really terrific, George's and Seymour's and Doug's, you know, you hear the 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 potential voice behind each one. But I was struck by the strength of that particular prophetic tone. Um, it reminded me there was something there when we talk about rhetoric and prophecy. It reminds me of A. M. Klein. Another one of my favorite Montreal poets, Seymour would know that very well. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a strength of voice there that's, uh, I won't say that every poem is written in the same voice. On the contrary, there, there are, there's a variety, but there's something about that, um, uh, maybe an at-homeness with this kind of prophetic tone, which as we know, prophecy is very rooted in the past. You know, you can't be a prophet unless you have a very strong sense of the past as well. So this interweaving of voice and the past and and the questioning of what is to come um, was something that struck me very much uh, this evening. So thank you, Philip. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed having the opportunity to reread the poems and to to be part of this and to discuss with you. Yeah, and I also feel very privileged to have had the four of you along and, and a, a lot more interesting than just having the usual kind of thing where the, the author reads his stuff or her stuff. And, you know, there's a little bit of give and take. And of course, it's the, of course, we're all missing the ritual glass of wine. A, a colleague of mine pointed out this morning is, you know, how are we going to get a of glass of wine? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, good. I noticed no. that one or two people were having a glass of wine. Ah, there you are. <laughs> I have a coffee cup with water. It's horrible. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, uh, me too. I've got water, which is uh, not doing too well. But here, anyways. So, listen, everyone, I think we are sort of at the end, and it, it has been terrific, a really magical evening, I think. And not the least because of, of both of the the purpose of us getting together to, to launch this book, but also the audience as well. And all these, uh, Phil has many friends here who have been, Sid Katz, others who have been friends for decades and decades. And um, that, you know, they, they stay together and, and, uh, and it's very, very important. And I think we know now that community is so important now that, uh, we have trouble kind of keeping with that community. 
And uh, so I, I thank very much on behalf of the Emeritus College of UBC and the Odyssey Group um, and Phil and all of you for being so um, so relaxed and 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 so generous with your your um, time and and your thoughts and um, I hope we can do this again sometime and thank very much the staff who has had to could do a kind of choreography that's quite complex and to do it so seamlessly. So I thank you all. Uh, Diane, yes. uh, can alum alumnus like me of UBC, am I permitted to join your college? You certainly are. Yes, we can yeah. put you forward for a membership, not a problem. All right. <laughs> I'll sponsor <laughs> you with pleasure. You're yeah. not you're not retired yet though. Are you? Oh, he is, yes. I, I you are. Retired. Okay, then there's perfect. I finally retired after 47 years. <laughs> they pushed they kept pushing me out the door and I finally left. Right. That's We're it. stubborn. Okay. Uh, well, thank, three, thank three here at Salia boys in the same group. I don't know, Diane. <laughs> Might lead to some issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. What a, what a great group. Thank you so much for coming. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>